I'm a faculty member here at the university uh, in the Honors College, and I'm also the Carruthers Chair of Honors, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you here tonight uh, for this event. I believe we're in for a scintillating, fun, educational evening together. <laughs> this event is the first event in our Carruthers Lecture Series for this year. We're focusing on the theme of My New Mexico. Uh, I think this is a perfect way to start. We're thrilled to get into our conversation. We're also thrilled with the fact we have the perfect person to set the table to get us going. Before I bring him up, I just want to say a couple thank yous to make sure that they get said. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Alicia Keys and Albuquerque Film Office. <laughs> We're very grateful that Albuquerque has partnered with us to make this event a reality. I'll admit I was a little bit peeved a few times when Alicia wasn't answering my emails very quickly, but apparently she had a bigger deal in the works, uh, so uh, I understand now. I'd also like to thank uh, Dean Greg Lanier, uh, Director of Honors Jeannie Baca. I want to thank my wife Rachel for helping me with the details and ideas. And I want to thank our Carruthers student ambassadors who helped with the planning of this event. A couple more. I'd like to thank the organization Quirks, which is a, a relatively new business started by Honors College students that's helping us with the media here and live streaming. Hopefully we're live streaming. Uh, thank you for that. And lastly, I need to thank Luis Roca who has tirelessly done everything. The fact that we're here at the same time with the lights on, with Vince here, parking spots, it wouldn't have happened if Luis hadn't done it. So I want to thank him for his work. Okay, so as I said, we have the perfect person here to help us start the discussion tonight. So let me tell you a little bit about Mayor Tim Keller. Uh, Tim Keller was... Keller was born and raised in Albuquerque. He graduated from St. Pius, where he played quarterback. Yeah. Then he went on to Notre Dame, where he didn't play quarterback, I bet, at Notre Dame. <laughs> he earned an MBA from Harvard, and then after a successful 15-year stint in private business, or in the private sector, excuse me, uh, he served two terms as state senator, a term as a state auditor, and then was elected mayor in 2017. He was championing the New Mexico film industry long before it became cool to do so. He was profiled. <laughs> mayor Keller was profiled by the New York Times and called the hashtag metal mayor uh, for his love <laughs> of heavy metal. And now the mayor with his wife, Dr. Liz Keller, are working to make Albuquerque everything it can be. So please join me in welcoming Mayor Keller to get us started. Well, this is a almost ready to start. Check. Are we out there, Albuquerque? Maybe I should just do the heavy metal intro for you. That probably, <laughs> that probably would work better. But uh, let me just say this. I'm so honored to be up here to introduce uh, the gentleman to my left. And I just want to share with you a few thoughts fundamentally about uh, really storytelling. And today we are gathered here to hear from one of the great storytellers in America. And for me, it's also oddly the story of our city. And in some ways, it's even the story of me as a person. And so let me explain a little bit. Working backwards and in an unorthodox fashion, a little bit like Pulp Fiction, perhaps, let me connect a few uh, unconnectable things for you. First, number one, we announced it last week, but the final vote was about an hour ago. Netflix is coming to Albuquerque. <laughs> such a 
such an amazing thing for our city. And I want to thank our city council for that eight to zero vote. And of course, we, we, all, we already mentioned that. Uh, there is one woman, we mentioned her before, but I got to tell you, we're excited about Netflix. We're doing lots of cheers. This woman deserves one more. Netflix is here, at least for my administration, because of one woman, Alicia Keys. And where are you, Alicia? You should wave and stand up. I know she doesn't quite look like a pianist. She's in the back. She's our Alicia Keys. She's the one who brought Netflix here. So when we think about the Netflix story, the amazing thing is it actually stretches a lot longer back in time. Once upon a time, in a state called New Mexico, there was a governor. His name was David Cargo. I don't think anyone probably remembers. A couple of folks might remember, a few heads in the back. He started the Film Commission. So he was the godfather of film in New Mexico, if you want to call it that. And there were many, many people along the way, including Ann Lerner, who's here, and some others. And the film industry sort of ebbed and flowed. But let's give Ann a round of applause. And lo and behold, sometime around 2000 something or other, the film industry was actually under fire. Believe it or not, there was a debate on whether or not we should have the film industry here. And so luckily, I happened to have just been elected and was able to put together a deal to provide some funding and some support for a little known TV series called Breaking Bad. <laughs> And so, as Netflix said when they actually announced they were coming, they referenced our film history. They also referenced the fact that Breaking Bad had showcased New Mexico as a great place for film. And of course, the founder of that was Vince Gilligan. So in a way, Netflix is here also because of Vince Gilligan. So thank you for Netflix. Now, I think the only other piece of this story that I want to share is that for me as a person, I want to talk about one other series that some of you might remember. It was called X-Files. Yeah. Anyone remember that? He had a lot to do with that too. So, you know, for me actually, X-Files actually taught me a lot. I was an impressionable teenager. X-Files made me believe in magic. It made me appreciate mystery. And I think it also taught me something about having confidence in your intuition. And that's still something I think of. And in fact, I will confess, I still watch reruns of X-Files at least once a week. <laughs> and so it was a tremendous program. And then coming along later, experiencing Breaking Bad and its connection with Albuquerque, for me, it taught us a lot about our own city. It taught us some things that we love. It taught us all those great locations. It taught us, I think, about people that we might have even known in our own lives that we thought we knew. You know, I, I, I still think I went to high school with Jesse Pinkman. Um, <laughs> and I, my teacher might also have been a certain chemistry teacher, but you know, it's amazing how much of that rings true. But also in that way that is, I think, somewhat, um, you know, it is what it is in that sometimes art reflects reality and sometimes reality reflects art. And sometimes it is a little bit of a mirror that reminds me of the challenges that we have. But fundamentally, it reminds me that we have to own our own identity. We got to acknowledge where we're at. We have to acknowledge that we're a gritty city, but we're a special city. And we have a story to tell. And so tonight, we get to hear from one of those storytellers. And when I think of storytelling, I do believe I'm not a historian, have no real background in this, but I remember, since it's the honors program, I remember reading the classics and the Theban plays and all this stuff. I gotta tell you, it, it dawned on me uh, a while back, it's like, who, a hundred years from now, what are they gonna study from our generation or from our century? I'm sure there'll be some writers in there, but I think they're actually gonna study our film and TV. That is the Shakespeare of our times. This is the masterpiece of our times. And this is the storyteller, the legend, that I believe will be talked about for centuries to come. So we welcome you. I hope that's true. But I gotta say, I, I really believe that what you have, at a minimum, showed us about ourselves and about humanity will have a lasting impact and will be something that many of us study. 
So we welcome you here. We thank you for spending time at UNM with the Lobos. And I'm grateful as a person for what all of you've done has taught me and for the small and big ways you've helped me, perhaps even as a mayor, through what I've learned through X-Files and Breaking Bad, but also for building and championing our film industry and bringing us to that place. Ladies and gentlemen, this Gilligan. Uh, as I said, my name is Ryan Swanson, and we'll jump right in. Uh, the point of this conversation that's coming up is to think about our community, uh, the state of New Mexico, the city of Albuquerque, through the lenses uh, of these shows that you've created. Uh, just a brief word on format. This is going to be a moderated Q&A for the beginning of this session, and then towards the end, we'll turn, sort, uh, we'll turn to some questions from you all. There are two ways to get your questions in. Uh, if you have already turned in one of those index cards, we'll use those. Uh, some of our Carruthers student ambassadors are working through those right now. Or if you would like to tweet a question, uh, we can get it that way. The hashtag is not up there. Let's see. Uh, hashtag Breaking Bad ABQNA. Uh, so go ahead and, and text. Uh, you can tweet your questions there. We don't need much introduction. I'll let you talk about it. But I'll just say briefly uh, that you have not only written Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul, uh, worked as a director as well. You've also done some movie scripts such as Hancock and Home Prize. You're a native of Virginia, a graduate of uh, New York uh, University Film School, and now a resident of Los Angeles. We're really glad to have you here tonight. Uh, All right. <laughs> there we go. All right. All right, so let's start pre-Breaking Bad, if we can. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey to becoming a writer and talk a little bit about the kinds of books and movies and shows that you enjoyed as, as your thinking and writing matured? I um, was a real movie geek growing up, and I think uh, in large part that was because my father loved old movies, and this was long before cable TV and VCRs and whatnot, but I have these memories of my dad, back when we only had four TV channels, waking me up in the middle of the night and saying, oh, you gotta get up, bad day at Black Rock's on, and I'm like, what a movie? So he introduced me to Spencer Tracy movies and John Wayne movies and, and a lot of Westerns. Okay. Um, so I, I, loved, I, loved, uh, I loved old movies, I think in large part because uh, of my dad's influence, and wanted to make them, wanted to make movies. And, and later on, I realized that uh, movies, television, they're basically, you know, they're kind of the same thing, except for a movie is two hours worth of story, and a, and a, uh, a TV show is 100 hours worth of story, more or less. But uh, I grew up um, watching a lot of old movies, um, grew up reading um, a lot of Kurt Vonnegut. Okay. I liked his uh, absurdist view of, uh, you know, I mean, a guy who had been through unbelievably horrible Tragedy, tra the tragedy of World War II, being in in a uh, slaughterhouse, uh, you know, an underground bunker type thing, uh, mm -hmm. while the, the city of Dresden was 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 firebombed flat, and then writing a comedy about it. That was that stuck with me. The idea of finding dark comedy in the in the most horrific circumstances. Uh, loved loved uh, loved Vonnegut as a, as an author. Uh, loved, I'm probably not as well read as I should be, but loved Faulkner. Loved Edgar Allan Poe. I grew up in okay. Richmond, Virginia. Grew up in Farmville, which is a little town uh, mm -hmm. west of Richmond, and then was born and then spent some time in Richmond. And, and that was Poe's uh, home for quite a, quite a few yeah. years. Uh, the, the Edgar Allan Poe house is still there right. downtown, and uh, he meant a lot to me. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah, I could go on. But yeah. Uh, some of the starting points. Good, yeah. good. Um, so, as we think about Breaking Bad, this important show, there's a lot of places we could start our discussion, um, but this is a university campus, so I think it's really fitting that we start with the tidy whitey question. Um, so, I have to ask you, at what point did you decide, when you're putting this pilot together, this first scene together, that it's a great idea to have Brian Cranston 
spending a lot of time in his underwear in this first episode um, to talk a little bit about that, but then more generally talk about how you set the scene of Breaking Bad in that first episode. Well, you know, they tell writers, write what you know, so I was typing away, and I, I looked down at myself and wiped away the Cheeto dust, and then saw Tidy Whitey's, and nothing else, so I said, I'll throw that in. <laughs> it, it, um, <coughs> I had this image in my head of, uh, of how the, the show should open, and mm -hmm. I, I, I thought, you know, what's that? That, by the way, that first uh, three to five minute uh, sequence uh, of, of each episode of Breaking Bad and, and now uh, Better Call Saul is uh, uh, is kind of a shout out to the X Files, mm -hmm. uh, the, the mayor's, mayor's favorite show. Um, and, and what I learned on that show was was the idea of having a teaser. Okay. Uh, to tease the audience, to keep the audience watching through the uh, first commercial break, the yeah. first three to five minutes. You want to? I was taught by my, my boss on that show, Chris Carter. You really want to grab the audience. Yeah. Uh, right from the get go, and so I figured a guy wearing a gas mask and and, and tidy whities and, and uh, driving an RV full of chemicals and two yeah. dead bodies and you know at 100 miles an hour through the southwestern desert would would be. Uh, that would get people's attention. Yeah, yeah. And it was very inorganic of me because I didn't have a reason when I was writing the teaser for him to be, I mean, I knew he was going to cook map and all that, but I didn't have a reason for him to be just in his own case. Okay. <laughs> I had to cobble that up. Okay. And I would not recommend that. I think the best kind of writing is organic. That is an example of very inorganic writing where you, you have something that excites you and then you reverse engineer to it, and we yeah. have had our moments on both shows where we've done that, but I'm not particularly proud of them. It's, it's inorganic and therefore not as clean, Okay. Uh, but but we do it from time to time, and that was a good example. Yeah, it certainly worked, grabbed our attention in that um, first episode, never yeah. seen uh, one quite like that, so yeah. <laughs> um, now I've heard you quoted uh, in print and I think in interviews as well saying that you came here because of the tax incentives, and to, to, pick, to put it simply, uh, there's yeah, probably a story no, no, no. there. Sure. Uh, you came here because of that economic opportunity, um, but then once you got here, you said that Albuquerque became a character in Breaking Bad. Absolutely. Can you talk about that? Um, what does that mean? Uh, how did it play out in the writing, the filming process? Is there a moment where you it just kind of hit you that this place is a big part of the story? Can you talk about that a bit? It, it, absolutely. I'm happy to. I'm always happy to talk about this. When I wrote... Uh, when I conceived of Breaking Bad, I wrote that first hour's mm -hmm. episode, the pilot episode. Yeah. Um, I did uh, have in mind Southern California, where, yeah. where I live uh, most of the time. Uh, in fact, I had in mind the Inland Empire, which is just east of, uh, of Los Angeles, because, uh, honestly, for two reasons. One of them was that I just figured if I'm going to have a TV show, I'd like to be able to sleep in my own bed at night and, and drive to the set and not have to, you know, to this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that was a big part of it, and simple as that. And then the other uh, part of it was I had I was friends with a, a, a drug enforcement administration uh, agent, a DEA agent, uh, who was a guy who uh, kind of sort of the character of Hank Trader is, yeah. is uh, a little bit inspired by. And he was working out of the Riverside dis district office in yeah. Riverside, California. So I thought, oh, why not? I've yeah. been there, I've visited, you know, I've, I've uh, Gotten a tour and whatnot. I'll just uh, write what I, I, you know, based on that. Yeah. The best thing that could have possibly happen when when Breaking Bad started, uh, when the pilot started going into pre-production, was, was was what you spoke of. Um, some of our executives at Sony, Sony Television, which yeah. is our studio, called me up when, when I was in the early stages of pre-production and said, "What do you think about shooting in Albuquerque, New Mexico, yeah. instead of Riverside or, or some other place?" In the, Los Angeles, greater Los Angeles area. Yeah. And I said, why? And they said, New Mexico is this very cool state, this yeah. very uh, forward looking state that is that, that has uh, created a, a financial incentive package whereby uh, you, we, we can, you know, as a production, we can have, we can save some money on our, on our production, employ a lot of, you know, the New Mexico folks, win-win for everybody. Yeah. And, What's good for you as a producer is you'll get you more money and wind up on the screen. You yeah. can make a more ambitious show than you would be able to make in, in Southern yeah. California. 
And they said at the time, they said, uh, I said, well, they said, but I, they, they said, we, we know you, you want to set it yeah. in California, but we figure all you do is really change out the license plates on the cars. <laughs> <laughs> and the smartest thing I did was agree to shoot it in the Mexico yeah. and, not, and not push back. And you know, it took all the 30 seconds of a phone call before I said, yeah, let's, let's shoot it in Mexico. The other smartest thing I did was to say, we're not going to change out the license plates and never point the camera east toward the Sandias. We're going to make it Albuquerque for Albuquerque. Yeah. Because, unfortunately, and this is the statement, this goes for all 50 states, there is a method no more here than anywhere else, probably. Okay. Uh, you know, I'm not an expert on that, but yeah. there is, unfortunately, uh, a meth problem in all, yeah. all 50 states. Yeah. So why not in New Mexico? Yeah. Greatest thing that could have happened because very shortly, uh, probably somewhere in the middle of shooting the pilot episode, 10, 11 years ago now, which I was lucky enough to get to direct. Yeah. I'm looking at these beautiful New Mexico skies, just yeah. endless, going forever. This, I tell you, the clouds alone in New Mexico are worth uh, shooting. Mm -hmm. Southern California, and probably plenty have been there, or certainly you've seen it all your lives on. TV shows, sitcoms, or whatnot, just yeah. a blank blue sky. Yeah. Very rarely there's even a cloud in the sky, which is the antithesis of, of cinematic, you yeah. know, just blank, you know. Uh, the clouds alone are worth coming. Okay. I love the clouds. Uh, they're just fantastic. I never get tired of them. Mm -hmm. The sunrises, the sunsets. Truth be told, I see the sunsets more often than the sunrises, <laughs> but, yeah. but just the magnificent, the sandias, the, 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 the plains, uh, and around uh, the city, the, the city yeah. itself, it's endlessly cinematic. Yeah. The best thing that ever happened to us. And yes, it became very much uh, a character in the show. And I realized that, we all realized that, not just me, all of our writers and yeah. producers realized that, and directors certainly, very early on. Okay. Couldn't have, couldn't have been a better bit of happenstance. Huh. I, don't, I don't know, I don't know that this is an <laughs> overstatement. I, I think if the show had shot in Southern California, Maybe it would have done pretty well, you know, but yeah. I, I, I don't think, well, it certainly would not have been the same show, and I don't think it could have been as good a show. Yeah. Uh, just, it worked out tremendously. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. thank you. Um, I think of you as kind of a jet-setting guy, right? You go, oh, yeah. You're, you're LA, <laughs> you probably travel to big cities, Toronto, New York, you do some of this. Um, I'm just curious a, a little bit more on Albuquerque. How do you explain Albuquerque? What do people ask you about Albuquerque now that you've portrayed it, uh, and I would I to explain the city uh, to people as you travel around and they ask you about Breaking Bad. I tell them I'm more comfortable here than I am in Los Angeles. Um, you know, and that, that's the truth. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, and I don't want to make it sound like I'm blowing smoke here to a New Mexico audience, nor do I want to unnecessarily rag on another city, but I personally, I grew up in a small town. And this is not a small town. I grew up yeah. in a really small town, Fargo, Virginia. But I lived a while in Richmond, which is, Richmond's about roughly the same size yeah. as Albuquerque. I personally am more attuned to a city this size. Yeah. Uh, Los Angeles is, is enormous, and the traffic gets worse by the day. Yeah. Uh, just, you know, I probably traffic gets worse everywhere by the day, but yeah. I notice it more there because I'm there most of the time. Yeah. So not to rag on Los Angeles, but I, I find, I tell people, Say, well, what's Albuquerque like? I say, I really, I love it. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a, New Mexico is a beautiful state. People are great. I feel at home there yeah. or here when I'm here. You know, I'm yeah. saying it to them back there. Yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. Okay. I mean, it really is. I, I tell them to wear plenty of sunscreen. They come yeah. Up. Yeah. And to stay hydrated. Yeah. Uh, Chapstick. Yeah. But it's, yeah. It's a really interesting landscape. You got to be tough to live here because. I was, I was talking to uh, 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 my uh, co-worker, uh, Jen, in the back there, one of our producers of yeah. El Sol. We were driving back from Q Studios. If you go out, you know, if someone dropped you from a helicopter or yeah. something in the middle of the plains out there, you know, you die. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you gotta be tough to live here. You gotta have the sunscreen and the big hat, and yeah. you, gotta, you, gotta, you, know, you gotta keep your skin covered, you gotta be hydrated. And, yeah. You gotta be, it's, I think that's cool. Yeah. I think it's, <laughs> there's a sort of, it's not, that's not pioneer spirit, not the right word, because I mean, there's been people living here a long time, but I mean, it's, it, yeah. you gotta have, uh, you, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta be kind of tough, in yeah. a good one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 
Uh, we're going to go ahead and look at, at one clip. We've got two clips tonight just to help us think through um, what you've created and how it looks. Uh, so we'll go ahead and, and start that up if we could. Seven grand, or I make that one's eighty-five. This is all the money I have in the world. You're a drug dealer. Negotiate. <laughs> <laughs> you, you are not how I remember you from class. I mean, like, not at all. <laughs> wait, wait, hold on. Tell me why you're doing this. Seriously, why do you do it? Money, mainly. There you go. Nah, come on. Man, some straight like you, giant stick up his ass, all of a sudden at age, what, 60, he's just gonna break bad? 50. It's weird, it's all, okay? It, it doesn't compute. Listen, if you've gone crazy or something, I mean, if you've, if, you, if you've gone crazy or depressed, I'm, I'm just saying, that, that's something I need to know about, okay? I mean, that, that affects me. Why do they um, let their selfishness and their pride kind of take over? Why do they break bad? Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk about why you wanted to explore this taking over uh, yeah. of, of that side of humanity, uh, which is, is obviously uh, portrayed there really nicely in that, in that clip? Thank you. Um, I'll start by saying one of the greatest things about writing for television, and I didn't see this coming, I had to mm -hmm. do it for a few years to understand this, is you think you know what you, who your character is when you start. When I started from Breaking Bad, I thought I knew who this character was. And this character, I was wrong. This character mm -hmm. revealed himself to me, to my fellow writers on the show. Uh, it, it's, I, I'm going to use that word organic again. It's a very interesting organic process of storytelling. When you are blessed with the opportunity to tell mm -hmm. the story of one character for, for years on end, you learn things about that character, you discover things, you make these wonderful discoveries. All I have to say, to start with, yeah. I was, I'm, I love television. I'm a big TV fan. I watch old TV. I watch, I watch mostly old TV when I get home. But, uh, but I watch, there's fantastic TV on new, old, all stripes. I'm a big fan of my whole life. But one thing I noticed about TV was uh, it rewards not reward, that's a better way to put it. it. It's designed, there's a certain degree of stasis built into traditional television. Mm -hmm. Historically speaking, and it makes perfect sense when you think about it, if you're watching The Simpsons, yeah. and, and if you if you have created The Simpsons, you want The Simpsons to go on forever. Yeah. 30 and, years or yeah, something. 30 right years. Yeah. Yeah. From another era, if you want to watch, if you, you create the TV show MASH, you want it to go on forever. You want Gunsmith to go on forever because that's how you make yeah. money. And the longer the show goes, the more you make it. So, I mean, just for dollars and cents economic terms. So, historically, television is designed to, to have a degree, quite a degree of stasis. In other words, Sheriff Matt Dillon, in year one of Gunsmoke, or year 20 of Gunsmoke, is basically the same guy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the actor gets 20 years older physically. Yeah. You know, Alan Aldo and Nash, you know, the 18 month police action that was Korea, you know, yeah. is now 11 years older by the end of the thing, physically, yeah. which is a 
interesting time to work. But, but the yeah. characters are all pretty much the same because if the characters change to any great degree uh, purposefully throughout, yeah. throughout an indefinite run of television episodes, as a showrunner, as a creator, as a writer of the show, you just don't know where you are at any given moment. You don't know where, you, where you're going. So I thought it'd be interesting to, I didn't want to do a show that lasted 11 or 12 years, just because I didn't think I physically could hack it. And I thought, well, we'll probably not get that much time anyway. How about we do an indefinite amount of seasons, three or four or five? Yeah. But the, the, the plan from the get-go is to take the main character and evolve or devolve him. Yeah. Make him, you know, the, the way I would pitch it, you guys probably heard something like heard before, but the, 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 the quick one sentence pitch in the room to, to various folks I was pitching to was we're going to take Mr. Chips and turn him into turn him, yeah. him Scarface. Yeah. Take the good guy and turn him into the bad guy. Yeah. And that was the, that was the, the nickel pitch. And, um, and it was so, that's as simple as that. The answer yeah. to the question is I thought it'd be a different way to go because what's the point of doing something the way everyone else does it? Yeah. Wanted to, to sort of turn the uh, paradigm of television a little askew, turn it on its ear or whatever. Having said that, I thought, okay, he's a good guy. This is back to my original part of the answer. Is, okay, he's a, he's, a, he's a good guy. But he gets into criminality, he gets into cooking meth, and it changes him. It makes him a bad guy. Yeah. What it took quite a while, it, it dawned on a lot of people quicker than it may have been. It, it took me a while to get it. But he was, it's sort of like that, that uh, metaphor about you know being drunk. Being drunk doesn't make you different than who you are. It makes you more of who yeah. you really are. You know, yeah. or success. They say you know success. Uh, Hollywood doesn't make you, for instance, uh, you know uh, a bad person necessarily, but it makes you more of, of who you really yeah. are. Yeah. which couldn't have a lot of bad in it. Um, yeah. you know, to begin with. In the, in the case of Walter White and Bringing Bad, it dawned on me and the writers, finally, after three or four seasons, this guy, this was just revealing layers of a person who was already there but was too timid or cowardly, cowardly maybe too strong a word, but it was the idea that became revealed to us was this character always had this darkness. Yeah. He was just too scared to let it out. Hmm. But this death sentence that he gets in the first half of the first episode frees him up to be who he really is, right. and who he really is is not really that powerful. Yeah. So that is completely huh. different than my original pitch, my original estimation of who the character was, huh. which was fantastic, it was liberating, it was very interesting yeah. from a writer's point of view to realize, I thought I knew this guy and I didn't. Yeah. But that kind of makes sense, that's like, uh, you know, in, in, in life we, we, we meet people, we think we know them, we think we, think we know ourselves. Yeah. Maybe we don't. Maybe we've been lying to ourselves about the people we, we love or are important to us. Maybe we're lying to ourselves about ourselves. Maybe we're not even who we think we are. It's not as good as we think we are, are you saying? Well, no, no, no. no. And, 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 and by the way, I'm talking about one character, yeah, yeah. Walter White. This is not, this is not to say every, everyone has, well, we're all human beings. We all, yeah. contain, we all contain multitudes, mm -hmm. all good and bad. Walter White contained more bad, I think, than, than the average person. The, the thesis, <laughs> the thesis of Breaking Bad, was not to say that this could happen to anyone who did mm. this. Uh, it was this particular guy in this particular set of circumstances. But, yeah. but one of the interesting things about this character to me is he was. People say, well, what, you know, you always say, what, what's 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 this guy's superpower? Yeah. What superpower is? He's a genius, and he's he's an amazing chemist. I always thought, no, his superpower is he was the world's greatest liar. He could lie to anyone about anything, yeah. but really the person he lied to with the most success was himself. Mm -hmm. And only at the very final episode does he actually, is he actually somewhat yeah. truthful in one small moment. Yeah. Is he truthful with himself? Yeah. But that was, uh, that was uh, I kind of got off on a tangent there, but it yeah. was fascinating to have these things revealed to us in the writer's room over the course of many years. It yeah. took many years to, to realize this. Yeah, fascinating. So for the writers in the room, I mean, it's just, it's, 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 it's a great opportunity to, uh, you know, I, I feel so lucky to get to write for television. Yeah. But, you know, I suppose you can do this, you don't have to do it in TV, you can do it with novels, you yeah. can do it with, but you learn about your characters huh. uh, as they progress, yeah. if you're lucky enough to get to, to write about them long enough. Yeah. 
Um, as as we've been preparing for this event, uh, I mentioned to, I've mentioned to a number of people that I found uh, Breaking Bad in particular to be very powerful, but also disturbing. Uh, you know, I my wife and I dealt with it in we'd watch Breaking Bad and then an episode of Parks and Rec and then Breaking Bad. And, you, know, you know, so it was this because it was they were such powerful, disturbing images, and I'm just wondering as a writer, uh, did you ever? Were you ever disturbed by any of these scenes that you were helping to create? Oh yeah, no, I, I you, you feel a weird kind of guilt toward, uh, I felt a, a kind of a strange guilt toward uh, uh, the abuse we heaped mercilessly on, on Jesse Pinkman. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, that poor guy. Poor kid, kid got his ass kicked every other episode. Yeah. Uh, and, and actually we didn't, you know, we didn't, we weren't, at, at the beginning, it would be awesome. This would be a cool scene. Well, I was, at a certain point, you have, I had such affection for Jesse. I lost affection for Walt as the, as the seasons, as the years progressed, but I, I gained respect and affection for the character of Jesse. I felt more and more like, man, this, this poor guy. I mean, yeah. uh, but you go where the drama takes you. You yeah. go where the story takes you. And um, so it was never desire. We were never gleeful about yeah. losing him. But the, the show was very dark, and, and when it ended, I was very sad that it ended. I mean, I was a lot more than anyone who brought yeah. it to an end because I felt like we were in danger of running out of story, and we wanted to end it on a high note. We, yeah. wanted, we wanted people to say, oh no, don't go, rather yeah. than, oh God, another season of this. <laughs> so I wanted to end it, wanted to err on the side of ending it too soon or yeah. too late, but when it did end, nonetheless, I felt very sad. And yet it was a relief as well. And I think Brian Cranston has spoken about this too. Brian said something that was something akin to taking off a very heavy, constricting overcoat. Yeah. And you feel kind of free afterwards. You feel 10 pounds lighter. Yeah. And it was interesting because, I mean, he had to embody the character. And it mm -hmm. was there was a certain amount of darkness for him. But I think he is better at taking that virtual overcoat off at night. Yeah, I was. We're in between seasons, but for for myself and for the other writers, you kind of had to live with this guy in your head 24 hours a day. Yeah. Wake up thinking about him. And I remember one time driving home from the writers' room at midnight one night uh, uh, through Burbank, California. Yeah. Not a particularly bad neighborhood or anything, but I'm stopped at a stoplight, and this car rolls up next to me, and I was just sure that someone was going to shoot me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, do I do I look here? I'm like, oh, there's a nice little old lady. <laughs> you know, and so it was in your head a bit. It was very much in my head, and it was a relief to uh, to to let it go yeah. when, when the time came. Yeah. Um, I, I mentioned that I have uh, one one blunt question for you, so I'm just going to put it out there and give you a bit of context. Um, do you ever feel guilty about what you did to Albuquerque in New Mexico? <laughs> um, and, and I ask that with the greatest respect in terms of what you produced. Um, but uh, the economic stimulus has been powerful. Uh, the artistic production has been beautiful. But all of us in here perhaps have had the experience where we travel and somebody says, where are you from? And you say, I'm from New Mexico. They try to make a connection. Oh, Breaking Bad. And immediately, we are Walter White, we're meth addiction, we're a crazy chemistry teacher, um, we're all these things. So you've really powerfully shaped the way people think about us. So it's kind of an unfair question, but I just wonder if you would oh, yeah, uh, we, postulate on it a bit. Well, we, we, we talked about it a lot, especially in the early days. Yeah. We, we were, first of all, wherever we, we landed, and, then, and as I said, we have the original plan was to shoot in Riverside yeah. or thereabouts, Southern yeah. California. At the, at the very beginning, I was worried, we were all worried, even more fundamentally than that, we were worried about, are people going to misread our intentions and think that this is a show glorifying criminality, specifically glorifying drug dealing, yeah. the dealing of meth, which is about the worst drug you can, you can be dealing. And by the way, that is, maybe as, worse, as a little aside, saying the thing that was interesting from a writer's point of view, to me, initially, the reason it was meth to begin with was that was about the worst thing in my mind that someone could monetize. Uh -huh. That was why it was meth. Hmm. It wasn't anything else, it wasn't anything 
beyond that. It was, yeah. you know, I want to take a guy who at the time, like I said, I thought was the good guy. Yeah. And he was kind of living a life of a good guy, except he was maybe too scared to break bad to be a bad guy. Yeah. What is, it's dramatically fascinating from a writer's point of view, if a good person had to make money so, was in such dire need of money that they monetized about the worst thing that yeah. they monetized. That's where it all came from. Yeah. So, you know, there was a great deal of concern on my part, on Sony's part, on AFC's part, or our broadcast yeah. network. Are people going to think that this is glorifying? Yeah. Drug use, drug dealing. Yeah. Uh, so we, that concerned us. It caused a few sleepless nights. At the end of the day, we went forward yeah. and, and we, 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 we kind of looked into our hearts and we said, are we glorifying this? Mm -hmm. No, this is, I want to present this worse than all, and yeah. then some. Yeah. So we figured, well, we'll just, you know, if we get misunderstood, we'll get misunderstood. Yeah. We have to go forward. And now when it comes to uh, Albuquerque, you know, I mean, there was so much, I don't have to tell you, you guys know better than I do, there's so yeah. much more to this city and this state than uh, any, any one cinematic portrayal. Yeah. And particularly when that portrayal as people think at home, that capital of the world, that's, you, that, yeah, it gives you pause. It makes you think, oh, God, I don't want that. Because as you guys know, I mean, this interesting, fascinating state. I mean, there are more, I read this somewhere, this, uh, I hope I'm getting my facts right, there's more PhDs per capita in New Mexico than there are in any other state. Because mm -hmm. you got Sandia National Laboratory, you got Los Alamos, yeah. you got the UNM, you yeah. the research, uh, you know, research yeah. you guys do here, you got that, and then yeah. it's, but it's also the, the cinematic look of the place makes it feel like uh, makes it feel like the Wild West. Yeah. You know, it, it looks it doesn't feel like the Wild West so much as it looks like the Wild yeah. West. You know, it, it, based on our portrayals, you know, our, what we have in our minds, portrayals, old movies and TV shows have given us. So it's a fascinating place. Again, from a writer's perspective, from that angle, you have you know Walter White was a was this brilliant scientist, and you got the Los Alamos mm -hmm. the, uh, the connection, but then you got the sort of the, the, the Old West connection. Yeah. Uh, getting off topic a little bit. Yeah, and, 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 and honestly, it, 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 it did, it gave us pause, not enough to stop us. But <laughs> it gave us pause. Fair enough. So you don't want, you don't want to, especially when people are nice to you and, and hospitable yeah. to you and welcoming you as a production to their community, to your community. You don't want to repay that by uh, inadvertently. Uh, Make it like tougher for anybody, <laughs> but hopefully the good outweighs. Yeah, yeah. No, thanks for thanks for thinking about it. Um, all right, I want to switch gears to Better Call Saul a little bit, and then we'll switch to some questions as well. Um, <laughs> Off. 
we were talking about breaking. I think we're heading in the wrong direction. Okay. Break their legs. Mm. How many legs? Two. They got two legs. One leg. Each. One leg each. <laughs> one leg each. That total of two legs. Oh, hey. Look. They can't skateboard for six months and they're scared of you forever. No. You show everybody that you are the man, but that you're fair, that you're just. No. One leg each. That's <laughs> tough. That's fair. So it's tough, but it's fair. This is this is a phrase we all need to use more, I think. Um, so, you know, talk a little bit about this. Uh, I like Jimmy McGill. I think, you know, unlike Walter White. He most of the time, although until recently, has wanted to do the right thing. He's a little bit shady, slimy, um, but he seems to have a moral compass to him, even if it's bizarre in his interactions with Tuco here. And, uh, Spinning pretty wild way at this point. Yeah. Yes, I, I, so I agree. Yeah. Talk, talk about the, the morals of Jimmy before, as he's becoming Saul, as, as you kind of see that character. Jimmy's a really interesting character to us. And by the way, again, to the writers, it's, it's a great place to start when you yourself are fascinated by, by your characters. You don't, you don't have to love them. Um, Walter White, I really had sympathy for uh, when it started, and I kind of lost most of my sympathy for him mm -hmm. by the end of the show, but I never lost my fascination for him. And uh, Jimmy McGill, for me, it gives me, the, the, it gives me both those things. Yeah. I'm fascinated by him, but I still have a great deal of sympathy for him because I feel that he was somewhat uh, inadvertently victimized by, yeah. by his brother. His brother who he loved like a brother. He loved, yeah. he loved him uh, probably the most important person in Jimmy's life. And then you find out at the end of that first uh, I don't want to give him out. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Yeah. Uh, you find out at the end of that first season his brother betrayed him in this yeah. very fundamental, very petty yeah. fashion. And, and so Jimmy, we don't know as much about and this was somewhat by design. We don't know quite as much about Walter White's background as we do, even by this point, uh, four seasons yeah. about Jimmy McGill's background. And Jimmy yeah. feels like more of, he feels more victimized by life than, than, than to me, Walt. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me, Walt did. But yeah, I, I love this character. And, and uh, when we, when Peter Gould and I, Peter Gould is, uh, is the guy who's actually, while I'm sitting here, uh, with you nice people. Peter Gould is actually back in uh, Burbank, California uh, with the writers coming up with season five. Uh, They're working. Uh, <laughs> uh, he's doing a magnificent job. He created yeah. the characters in the first place and then he and I created uh, Better Call Saul together. And he and I, when we were pitching it to the studio and the network, we, we said, uh, you know, better call Saul. What, what else are you going to call it? It's about Saul Goodman. And we really didn't have that great a plan in, in place <laughs> by the time we signed our names on the contract. Yeah. So then something was like, oh, what are we going to do here? <laughs> and we thought Saul Goodman is this calcified, amoral, morally, He's this character who is fun in, in, in little bits and spurts yeah. on Breaking Bad, but the more we really started deconstructing and thinking about it, we thought, this is, how do you build a show around this guy? We better go back to who he was before. Yeah. Because he says in that first episode of Breaking Bad that he appears in season two, my name, my real name is Miguel. Yeah. Uh, who was he before? Before, and this guy, who he was before, who again was the product of. And uh, another thing I want to say right now, it's wonderful how collaborative TV is. Yeah. You hear this now. There's this, this thing going on on TV now. It's uh, one writer wrote every episode and then directed every episode. And, uh, you know, really. 
I mean, you're hearing this more and yeah. more now. And by the way, no power to anyone who can do it all by themselves. Yeah. But I, I, I did, I've done some of it in my life and my career by myself. I've done most of it with other people. Yeah. I much prefer collaborating with, mm -hmm. with people. It's, it's, your work winds up so much better. Yeah. Uh, you, it's, it's this wonderful additive thing when you're working with, you surround yourself with smart people and you do, you, you do your best to surround yourself with people who are smarter and more talented yeah. than you are. This is really what you can achieve. And you still get to take credit for it. <laughs> but I, 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 would, I, would, you know, I would, I would say to the young folks who want to do what I do for a living, embrace the collaborative nature mm -hmm. of movie making, which includes television. Yeah. You know, this, the, the French gave us, God bless the French, and they gave us the auteur theory, where it's all about the director. It's all about, in the case of TV, it's all about the showrunner, and it's really you're, you'll be robbing yourself mm -hmm. if you get to that lucky. Position. Yeah. You're robbing yourself if you if you make too much of it. Mm. You know, it's it, you surround yourself. With, I'm sorry, that was a bit of an aside, but the yeah. point being, you know, the character of Jimmy McGill sprung from many minds. Yeah. Not least of all from the uh, mind and the uh, artistic and acting abilities yeah. of the wonderful Bob Odenkirk, yeah. who inadvertently. Uh, or, 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 Purposely, implicitly, and explicitly told us who this character was. Mm. Us, we, the writers, told us, helped and inform us who this character was by the one the way he played it week in, week out. The very yeah. complex, multi layered way he played it. So you just like it's it's so much fun getting to, you know, because if you knew, people always say, well, you knew what the ending of Breaking Bad was when it started, right? You knew, you know what the ending of the Bad was, don't you? No, you don't. And that's not a failing. That's not, as we say, that's not a that's not a bug. That's a future. That's it's. If you knew where you were going, what's the point of the journey? Yeah. I mean, you have a general direction you want to head. Yes, and you have thoughts, hopes, and dreams for where yeah. you want the show to wind up. And, and you'd be remiss not to. Is there a bit of fear and anxiety that comes with not knowing where you're going? There's nothing but fear and anxiety. Okay. The constant, the constant fear of failure. Yeah. And Ryan, you and I were talking backstage yeah. about you. You taught a class about it. Basically. Yes, I did. And Sounds like a downer, but it was. Yeah. I, I gotta tell you, I say this every chance I get to people. Failure is. Listen, I hate failure. You hate failure. We all do. Nobody wants to fail. But you never learn more in life from anything. That's what you learn yeah. the most in life from. Yeah. Failure. It's it's to be avoided, and yet when it happens, invariably, as it comes to all of us. Mm -hmm. Embrace it for the learning experience that that it, that it yeah. in, inevitably is. Yeah. People say to me, "Oh, you you know, bring bad, big big success. What did you learn from?" I didn't learn. I didn't learn anything. <laughs> I, I didn't learn much. Yeah. And that's an honest statement. That hmm. I didn't learn from the success of it. the failures that happened along the way, and the bigger failures because everything before Breaking Bad for me was uh, every every. I was a I was an employee on, on the X Files. I had yeah. a wonderful time writing that, and that was a big success. But I was yeah. just I was just essentially a glorified staff writer in that, mm -hmm. and I had a great time, and I learned so much. But everything I pitched that was my own thing until Breaking Bad failed, hmm. and um, and at the time it was the biggest bummer. And there was times <laughs> where you just want to quit to the hell yeah. with this. I don't want to keep doing this. But when you keep going, you look back, and I, I, I treasure those failures because. It's easy to, in hindsight, it's easy yeah. to, looking backward, I grant you, it's not, you know, at the time they were miserably painful. But you learn from those, and you think back, what did I learn from this? Oh, I learned not to do that. Yeah. What did I learn from this failure? Well, I learned never to do this thing again. You know, I burned my hand in a hot stove. I learned never to do the touch that thing again. <laughs> yeah. You know, you don't touch a cold stove and learn anything from it. You learn from touching the yeah. hot stove. So, yeah. 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 I, I got off of you know, no. Well, and maybe I can connect. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Maybe I can connect to that tangent. Um, uh, in terms of trying to maybe connect, uh, obviously there's all kinds of connections between the shows. But one thing that actually, as I was talking to our, our Carruthers student ambassadors, they mentioned um, Jimmy suffers a series of career setbacks. Right? He can't pass the bar. Um, he, he brings in a big case, but they still don't want to make him a, a member of HHM. Kim won't partner with him, these kinds of things. We saw Walt humiliated really in the career vocational field too. He was this brilliant scientist who ended up, it's 
noble to be a teacher, but nevertheless he felt humbled by that. So are you making a point, either explicitly or implicitly, about work? And New Mexico is a state that has struggled at times with unemployment. Uh, and I was just wondering, as you think about failure and work, you've, you've created this trail of career disappointments. Yeah, and there's a very, there's a very meat and potatoes reason for that. Yeah. It's drama 101. Really. <laughs> uh, there's a reason all the fairy tales you read as a kid ended with, and they lived happily ever after. Yeah. If, there was in, if there was one iota of drama in seeing people live happily ever after, that would be the fairy tale. Yeah. You wouldn't, you wouldn't even think about it. You wouldn't end with it. Drama is, is struggle. Yeah. Drama is facing obstacles and mm -hmm. either overcoming them or failing to overcome them. Yeah. Drama is failure. Yeah. Or, or at the very least, uh, uh, facing failure and then actually, the, I guess, the best, you know, the underdog, the best underdog yeah. problems, you know, the Rockies, you know, of, of fiction are, you know, you face overwhelming obstacles and you yeah. know, somehow by the skin of your teeth and the bit of you see. Mm -hmm. That's just drama 101. Okay. And so it's really, truly as simple as that. Yeah, yeah. But I think there is, I guess we all, not just me, but Peter Gould and our writers, we gravitate toward hard scrabble characters who okay. get kicked in the teeth time and time again, but yeah. pick themselves up. And, and uh, we even had that song. <laughs> we even had that song in a very memorable uh, yeah. scene at Breaking Bad, the old uh, Nat King Cole song. Pick yourself up, dust yourself yeah. off, and start all over again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's that's what these characters do, and you respect that, and you empathize with them, even when they're even when they're miserably nasty, yeah. or talent murderous characters. Yeah, we've got plenty of those of, of various uh, stripes, you know, on yeah. both shows. But you even you even wind up sympathizing with them a fair bit mm -hmm. because you respect their stick to it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll ask you maybe another a question or two, then we'll go to the questions that we've assembled uh, from the audience here. Um, let me ask you, kind of changing pace a little bit, one of our honors students here at, at the University of New Mexico is actually working on a senior project, and she's exploring minority representation in Breaking Bad. Wow. And we are a diverse state. That's one of the great things about New Mexico. Um, I think I heard you say, perhaps in a different interview, that you didn't have any Spanish-speaking writers as part of your original writing team for Breaking Bad. Um, I'm just curious how you how you made decisions about the race of your characters, how you kind of thought about those issues um, as you were putting together your cast and your show um, at Breaking Bad. Can you help out our student, give her a, a leg up? Give her, give her a good leg up. Yeah. We, we do have a, a, a Spanish-speaking uh, uh, member of our writing mm -hmm. staff now. Gordon Smith, yeah. uh, who used to be my assistant, and now he's an Emmy nominated uh, writer of uh, 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 Better Call Saul. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it's, 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 I think uh, we thought in terms of, you know, we looked around New Mexico, yeah. I guess just as I would look around Los Angeles and say, yeah. What is the composition of the you know the folks in the yeah, street? We yeah. try our best to 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 emulate that yeah. in the casting. And, yeah. uh, and of course, you know there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of bad guys on on, on Breaking Bad uh, who are uh, Spanish speaking mm -hmm. uh, characters, and, and, and so then you think to yourself, Jesus, I don't want, I don't want people thinking that's you know you, you counterbalance that mm -hmm. as best you can. Mm -hmm. and, uh, characters like uh, Steve Gomez. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Uh, Partner. And you just do your best. Um, I'd love us to get more uh, Native American uh, okay. characters. We, yeah. we, we try to. We've, 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 we've done uh, we've done our, we've done our best with that. It's, uh, we're always looking to, 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 to have more uh, uh, Native Americans yeah. uh, uh, on the show. Yeah. So we're always looking to do that. Yeah. But you, you want to make it. Just want to. In every other respect, we work our, we work our hardest to make the show feel authentic. Yeah, yeah. We try to make, uh, if there's a scene with an oncologist, we, we talk to a technical advisor and we say, well, what would an oncologist yeah. really say here? Yeah. If we're talking, if we got a DEA bust where they knock the door down, we yeah. talk to the DEA uh, entry team. Yeah. If uh, Walt is, is cooking and he's talking and he's, he's, he's giving some, you know, annoying uh, you know, primer on, yeah. on uh, you know, 
and with the, uh, I got yeah, science. You know, science. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then we will talk to tech advisors. So that's yeah. all uh, desire, that all uh, speaks to a desire yeah. to make the show feel as authentic and real life as possible. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, yeah, we can try to certainly try to extend that as yeah. much as we can with, uh, with the, the composition, yeah. the, the composition of the, uh, the folks yeah. uh, in front of the camera. Yeah. Well, let me, as we're, I'll take the questions, um, if we've got those, but as, as we're getting the questions from the audience together, let me ask you one last um, thing, and it's, we'll just switch gears again here. So, you obviously filmed our city, but let me, uh, to, to wrap up my portion of it, how did you live in our city? You know, you spent time here, uh, where'd you like to eat, what struck you as unique about the city, as someone who's been living here and, and um, a part of it? Uh, I think the New York Times quoted you as saying Albuquerque has stealth charm. Um, <laughs> I, I think that's a compliment. Uh, so if you could just talk about your experience well, no, here you know, on the ground. I'll, I'll say it. I'll say, uh, 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 you know, that doesn't sound, that sounds like a real fact. Uh, I think we get it. Here's the thing. I mean, when you, the very first time I laid eyes on Albuquerque, I was driving to California in my uh, 1987 uh, uh, GMC Jimmy, uh -huh. loaded to the gills. It looked like, uh, it looked like uh, Beverly Hillbillies. I was <laughs> driving in 1995 over, gosh, 23 years ago this month, I was driving to Los Angeles from Virginia to 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 start work on the Xbox okay. uh, as a uh, as a staff writer, and it was the first time I'd ever driven across country from from one coast to the other. Yeah. And uh, driving on the 40, I still remember it when it was history. <laughs> driving on the 40 through Albuquerque, and I thought, God, this is where Bugs Bunny used to be. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Driving through, um, when I talk about stealth charm, when you a lot of people access Albuquerque for the first time on one of uh, yeah. one one of the cardinal directions, either coming to or twenty five, forty or twenty five, and, and you say, well, it's a city built around the intersection of two the two freeways, yes. on the forty, and and when you when you experience Albuquerque, and like on that as a good example, on that trip, I had to get to work. I had to get to uh, Los Angeles within 48 hours to start yeah. working with the X Files, so I didn't get to stop. So I'm driving to Albuquerque, and I'm looking around, and you're on these elevated freeways, and yeah. you say, okay, I see a TGI Fridays, and I see an Applebee's, and, <laughs> you know, and you're like, uh, you know, it's a, it's, if, if, when that's your first point of, of, of entry, you know, you say, well, okay, you know, it's just, you know. You don't. You don't. You yeah. can't see. In other words, better way to put it, you can't see all the things yeah. that are special and wonderful and historical and, and interesting. Yeah. And working from the freeway. Yeah. Yeah. And when you get down into off the freeway, you yeah. just take an off take an off ramp, and you get down into the city, and you start talking to folks, and, and, you, and you start to feel the history. And, you know, you don't eat it in Applebee's, but instead you eat some <laughs> some good you know, uh, Christmas, you know, yeah. uh, chili and you know. You see and, and experience what, what the city has yeah. to offer. That, that's what I meant when I was talking yeah. about the New York Times about stealth charm. It takes yeah. it takes getting off of it takes taking an exit. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, when I was very much when I was talking to the reporter, I was thinking about that first experience yeah. uh, back in 1995. Yeah. But uh, no, it's a great it's a great city to spend time in. I love. Uh, gosh, it was. Uh, uh, Jennifer Jane, uh, the center name Jennifer Jane, Frenchish, Frenchish is a great restaurant. Yeah. I love that one. I love the Savoy, uh, Zinc. I've had a lot of great meals of Zinc. Uh, I love O'Neill's. Okay. It's a good place to yeah. have a drink. Uh, there's so many. Yeah. I know I'm forgetting yeah. much. Uh, the Savoy is actually where we shot uh, a great scene with uh, Walt and, uh, 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 and Gretchen, his former uh, yeah. former love of his life, who he, Treats terribly, and yeah. it ends the ends the uh, scene with him. One of our f bombs with yep. the show, where he's yeah. very nasty to him. That was shot with some boy. Yeah. Uh, my favorite restaurant of all within uh, within 100 miles of here. And no offense to Albuquerque, it's Geronimo in the Santa Fe. Oh, okay. Place. Yeah. Uh, but you know that's within yeah. an easy drive. Yeah. And there's so many great restaurants here. There's so many great museums. There's so many great. Uh, just yeah. a lot of. 
Yes. All right. Well, let's see. Questions? Well, we're going to, so the way we're going to handle this in order to maximize our Vince time, uh, rather than turning to open the mics, is, is we've collected questions. So I'm going to go ahead and read them if we sure. can just um, see what we can get here. All right. I'll try not to be so long. No, it's great. Speed round. <laughs> what is something you wish you could have done but couldn't get away with? I <laughs> uh, uh, You mean on the show? Uh, I would imagine. Uh, <laughs> yeah, because my mind did not go into <laughs> Whichever you want. It's your question. Uh, on the show, let's, 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 let's reduce the scope of the question to what, what I've enjoyed to do on the show and I couldn't get away with. You know, I, I've been very lucky. I, I can't. I, I, we, I mean, I guess you could say, you know, it's, it was, it's ad supported cable, so we couldn't curse like you do on HBO. Mm -hmm. We couldn't show nudity. That is really not that big a deal, not being able to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and as a matter of fact, there's a great saying about, you know, limits actually make or okay. uh, not complete freedom. Yeah. You know, the, the frame around the Mona Lisa is as important as the Mona Lisa because it's, it's the boundary, it's the mm -hmm. limit. There are li if you have limits either self-imposed, if, yeah. if, you're, if they're imposed by someone else, like a network, yeah. you say, well, why do they get a, I need freedom, man, you know? Yeah. Actually, limits actually help. Uh, and, and if no one else is imposing them on you, perhaps you need, as an artist, to uh, impose them upon yourself. Yeah. But I can't really think of anything. I, 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 you know, I, we couldn't, you know, we could show any kind of violence we could put her imagination to, which I'm yeah. not saying that is like a great thing, <laughs> yeah. uh, because, you know, it's hard, you know, our show was never meant for kids. Mm -hmm. I've run into people every now and they say, oh, you know, I'm watching it with my six-year-old, or whatever. Like, no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> Don't watch this with your child. <laughs> so, uh, this is my point, I'm rambling here. I said this would be the speed run. No, I no, can't really think anything. I was, uh, the more important thing is, uh, you know, is not to show it nudity or bad words, the more important thing is, is when your ideas get censored. Mm -hmm. That's the thing you need to do. And, and Sony and AMC were, were great to us. I yeah. can't think of anything that I was told you can't do. So, did I, not a great answer, but that's a true Did answer. I hear you say that your writing room censored you, one of your more... They didn't censor a day. I, I would never... That's the wrong term. Way, by the way, censor, use the word censor. Yeah. That's a, that's, a, that's a word you have to be careful with. Right. Not that, Nothing yeah. Nothing I've ever had in my career approached to yeah. what I would call censorship. I, yeah. I, I'm lucky to be able to say that. But no, what you're referring to is uh, what we had in our season uh, season two of, of the show, uh, Jesse, the love of Jesse's wife, Jane. Mm -hmm. uh, they're on heroin together. She is the love of his life, but they're clearly not good for each other. Mm -hmm. he, gets, he gets her back on meth, and she gets him on heroin. And, and, and Walter White shows up and inadvertently kind of jiggles the bed as he's trying to wake up Jesse, and she rolls on her back, and she chokes to death on yeah. her vomit. And, and uh, Walt watches this, not impassively. It's a very emotional moment. He yeah. starts to intercede, and then he does it because he realizes her death actually helps him and helps Jesse yeah. and his mind. It was a very powerful moment. When we first started talking about it, that was the closest we ever came to answer the last question. That was the closest we ever came to the studio and the network saying, God, do you really want to go this far? Yeah. But they didn't stop us. Mm -hmm. But my original, what you're talking about, my original pitch to the room was he, he was, takes a much more active stance okay. and he gives her an initial dose of heroin and actively moves her. And my writers uh, said, Okay. I mean, we're right. Yeah. And, and by the way, yet another thing, we're working collaborative making yeah. TV. I could have, out, I could have overruled them. I could have said, I'm the boss. <laughs> <laughs> and boy, I'm glad I did because yeah. when enough people tell you you're drunk, you need to sit, <laughs> you need to sit down. Yeah. <laughs> and, they were, and so what we came up with instead was, he doesn't do it on purpose, but when the when the critical moment arrives, he doesn't, it's a, it's a sin of, yeah. of, of inaction, okay. which, at the moment, feels just as dramatic, probably even more yeah. dramatic than you know going in with the you know mustache yeah. twirl on it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
What's your favorite fan story or experience related to the shows, or either of the shows? God, I so many. I, 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 I just been so blessed with the, the fan reactions, the, the worldwide. It, it's just astounding. I was just, I was just in Spain two, two or three weeks ago. Like, the, I've never even been to Spain before. I'm talking to fans. <laughs> it's just like, it's been so utterly mind blowing. I never saw any of this coming. I never thought this show. I, my, my hopes were so attenuated, they were so modest, mm -hmm. when I just couldn't believe that every step of the way any network would even order the show. I figured the best that could possibly come out of it was I could write a pilot that would get made. And then they said, oh, you can direct it too. Oh my god, are you serious? <laughs> you know, yeah. I, have, I have a one hour reel, uh, you know, I have a bit of film I could show to get another real job yeah. after this. After this aborted job that never came to, yeah. suddenly it's like, you know, who, who started coming? Probably the best, the coolest thing is, uh, met a lot of wonderful fans. Got to know all people, it's just so random. Got, I've gotten to know Warren Buffett very well. Really? Uh, <laughs> Warren Buffett is a super fan of Breaking Bad. And really? Is, uh, he has been to your beautiful city. Huh. Uh, he, uh, uh, he visited uh, the set of Breaking Bad in his final season. Uh, Blank. The wonderful restaurant uh, we had, we took him to lunch. Monte Carlo. Yeah, okay, thank you. <laughs> yes, the Monte Carlo. Is the Monte Carlo still there? Yeah. Good, excellent, great place. With the Naga Head booths in back, the red Naga Head. Oh. We had the best time. Uh, we went uh, to that wonderful back room there, and we all ordered hamburgers, because he's very much a hamburger. Yeah. <laughs> Brian and Aaron were there. So you got Walt and you got Jesse, and, and people are lining up for autographs. Completely ignoring Brian and Aaron. They all photographs and selfies with with Warren. Oh, really? really? And when the check came, I grabbed for the check. And Warren said, uh, "Let me get that." I said, "Oh, Mr. Buffett, it's, it's such a better story if I said." Well, <laughs> and he said, "No, it's not. It's a much more rare story for me to buy anyone one." <laughs> so you might as well take it while it's paid off. All right. He's like the coolest guy. He's like. Uh, Dude, that was that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Uh, let's see. Next question: uh, Which show is more difficult to write, uh, or, or was more difficult to write? Breaking Bad or Better Call Saul? What what makes it more challenging? They're all ridiculously hard. And you, <laughs> you know, I mean, and you think you're never going to get through it, and you and you just you just by the skin of your teeth, and more more than that, the help of all the good people you surround yourself. Yeah. With, you manage to get it done. They're all the hardest thing is the thing you're doing right at that moment. Yeah. It's just, and and it's ultimately a good thing because if this job got easier, that's when you start to coast. You you secretly want the job to get easier. You're only human. Mm -hmm. But if you're really being honest with yourself, if once a job gets easier, you're dead. It's time to retire. It's time yeah. to you know, move forward or whatever. <laughs> it's time to stop doing it. Because it means on some level, you were falling in, okay. I think. But I can tell you, uh, we thought, Peter and I thought, that Better Call Saul would be much easier to write than Breaking Bad because we knew the end of yeah. that. We were so naive. <laughs> <laughs> Knowing the ending and working to it makes it that much harder. It makes it, it, it because you have to, you have a scene where you say, oh, wouldn't it be great if we, you know, this character, Kill off this character yeah. in this moment. No, you can't. But this character is on Breaking Bad. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, what if Jimmy lost a leg and stuff? No, you can't do that. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. Extreme examples, but it's it's working to fit it all in prior to the well-known events of Breaking Bad makes yeah. it exponentially harder, huh. right? And we did not see that coming, and it's just as well we didn't because I think I don't know if it would have scared Peter off, but it would have scared me. Okay. Yeah, interesting. How did you go about selecting locations around Albuquerque and New Mexico for the show? Did you spend time just driving around and making notes of things that might look interesting in a scene? Good question. Uh, and a good uh, segue to give a shout out to a uh, UNM, UNM alum, uh, the gentleman who taught me, taught me this. Uh, <laughs> good. Christian Diaz de Bedoya, who is our location manager. Yeah. He went to UNM. Uh, and Loved it. He was telling me, uh, and I think uh, his nephew might be here. Uh, he said, uh, 
who's also yeah. a student. Um, thank you, sir. Um, Christian and his crew of, of scouts uh, are amazing. They're the best I've ever worked with. Mm -hmm. And they know uh, how to percolate the back of their hands, and they find a great taste, great eye, which you need. It's like, like a director's eye. Yeah. And you, um, uh, you know, I can, or Peter can, can, can tell Christian and his guys, we mm -hmm. need this, I mean, but we need, we need, the, we need a, like a, we need like a, a so we need we need a Victorian house, but we need the door when you go in. We need it. We need a wall immediately to the right because of the guy in the hiding with you. Know, yeah. Yeah. And then, okay, boss. And then they go and find it. Okay. And, and I'm constantly amazed. People say to me, "Well, you, Albuquerque is not that big a town. You must have shot it out by now. Right? Yeah. You must have seen everything there is to see." No, I know the moment. Yeah. I could shoot here another 50 years. We'd never see it. Mm -hmm. it's, there's so many cool things to point a camera. Yeah. Yeah. In this city, and uh, you know, I don't give a shout out. So, Ann Lerner was in the, in the audience. Uh, was, uh, she was a big part of the reason. She was a big part of the reason. Uh, early days of Breaking Bad, we, yeah. we got off on the right foot, and we and, and she she got us, uh, uh, you know, got us to meet all the right people and helped us out, help grease the wheels, make everything yeah. look right, and and. Uh, and Alicia, who is who is uh, who is now uh, doing the job, is, is a wonderful. Uh, yeah. Leader, as the mayor said, helped help to get Albuquerque to that place. But like we've worked with so many yeah. people in the film office and the mayor's office. We love Mayor Tim. Just you guys have been as a city. Yeah. Uh, you guys have been so. I mean, the police department's been great. The fire department, yeah. the local DEA, the, everyone's been. It's like I would, you know, I just. Yeah. And it sounds like I'm blowing smoke, but I swear to God, I, I, I'm grateful to get the opportunity yeah. to be able to say it to, to, to you folks. Yeah. Yeah. It seemed like Mayor Tim loved you too. Uh, so, um, this question, I'm an aspiring filmmaker, and I was wondering about your, pro I'm wondering what your process was in becoming a filmmaker. I, it's all I ever, I've been very lucky. The, the luck started with, it was all I ever really wanted to do. Yeah. When I was, Five or six years old, I wanted to be an astronaut. And that was the only other thing I did. That, that was not going to happen because I didn't have the, the, the eyes or the math ability or any of that. But uh, after that, I just wanted to make movies. Yeah. And that's what I thought at the time. I, mean, you know, I saw Star Wars. I was 10 years old in 1977 when Star Wars came out. And there's so many people my age yeah. and, and older and younger uh, who say that was a great uh, influence. And when that movie came out, I said to myself, I want to build robots and spaceships for movies. Yeah. And that that uh, metamorphosed, I'm not saying that word right, that, that transformed and it yeah. changed into, uh, don't, don't, you know, don't use a $10 or a $5 dollar <laughs> so far. Yeah. Um, that, that became, uh, you know, wanting to direct, wanting to write. I realized I had more talent for writing than I did yeah. for, uh, for sculpting. Okay. Uh, but, uh, I just always knew I was lucky and that I always knew what I wanted to do and then I just it's all over. Okay. So yeah, I didn't go to my high school prom. I didn't I didn't have a, I wish in hindsight I had had a more normal high school yeah. experience. But uh, I just was home every weekend writing little scripts and making spaceships and making little super eight movies and okay. stuff like that and it and it helped it helped get me to where I am and now my god, I would I would I would have killed someone for like an iPhone. I would have like, <laughs> yeah. because the, 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 the holy grail in elementary school and high school for me was a Super 8 camera. And I had to borrow it, like yeah. never afford one. But having the image quality available to you, you guys, there's like two, three hundred movie quality video cameras in this room yeah. right now. And it was, if you had, if, if, if 13 year old Vince you know, was here, came in a time machine and knew that, that the future would hold the, the ability to make movies and then edit them on your, you could, I don't you know, it's like it's astounding, <laughs> it's astounding the yeah. tools that exist now yeah. for image capture, for telling stories visually, and just, I can't even get over it, yeah. the, the technology, it's like we're living in Star Trek or something, it's like, it's <laughs> Yeah, uh, maybe time for a couple more here. Uh, before he appeared as Walter White in Breaking Bad, Brian Cranston was the dad in Malcolm in the Middle. Uh, 
which was a radically different part. How were you able to see white in Cranston's previous persona? Yeah, we did the, we, we did the spinoff, Malcolm and the Mifflin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, and by the way, I'm saying that I, I would be ridiculously remiss to not talk about Brian Cranston all here. Because yeah. I mean, I, for my money, Brian Cranston is the reason I'm up here tonight, mm. talking about the show, why it has such legs, why it was able to, to, to get a whole other great, a whole other great uh, uh, star. Yeah. Uh, Brian is, I think, the reason for you know, the secret sauce and the success of yeah. that and, and a fundamental linchpin reason for, for, for it becoming as beloved as it, as it is. And what I saw in him, I was very lucky. I, it was uh, an X Files episode that I wrote uh, in 1999. It was, I think, the first episode we shot. We moved production, uh, we changed crews and moved production from. Vancouver, uh, British Columbia, down to Southern California. Mm -hmm. The first episode we shot in California was an episode that I'd written called Drive. Okay. It wasn't the first one that airs we shot on our work. Anyway, that's the new shit. Nobody cares. <laughs> but uh, it was an episode about a, you know, probably a lot of folks know this story, so I won't go over it. But uh, it, was, it was an episode uh, with Agent Mulder driving in a car for various supernatural reasons, uh, with, a, with a guy holding a gun to his head, and mm -hmm. if the car stopped, the guy's head would explode. And uh, I was kind of ripping off speed, the movie speed. Yeah. Except supernatural. So the, we needed a bad guy to be in the back of the car holding a gun to our hero's head for 42 minutes of change. Yeah. And this person had, this actor had to be riveting, uh, had to be scary, had to be repulsive in a way because the character turns out to be this nasty, racist, idiot guy. And yet, at the end of it all, you had to feel bad for him when he died. Mm -hmm. And that was, it seemed at the time, an impossible thing to cast. It seemed, okay, we got plenty of scary guys, coming, yeah. but I don't, I don't want to him like a bug. I don't want to, I'm not going to feel sorry for him when he's dead. How do you get that whole package? How do you, and we were, I think it was a Friday before the Monday we were going to start shooting, and we were, we were Trouble. Yeah. And we had seen so many actors. I mean, dozens of them. Plenty of scary guys, like I say. But then this guy walks in, his name's Brian Cranston. I didn't know from Adam. He comes in with his long hair, long beard. He looks a lot like Gordon Lightfoot, you know, sort of <laughs> 1974 when he walks in. And, uh, and by the way, I'm talking to like, every the kids are like, who the hell is Gordon Lightfoot? <laughs> so anyway, Google it. Yeah, Google. So anyway, uh, uh, he walks in and he's just brilliant. Mm -hmm. And he walks out and I say, OTW. I'm just like grinning from here to here. OTW, off to war, bro. We yeah. got our guy. Yeah. And uh, and then 18 months later, he does this episode. He's magnificent, man. He's scary as hell. But you do feel bad. Or at least I did. felt mm -hmm. bad for him again. Uh, 18 months later, I'm watching TV one night. I'm watching our, our, our network, the Fox Network, because I'm still on Xbox. And there's this goofy guy, clean shaven, short hair, and in tidy whiteies. <laughs> Maybe I'm conflating a couple scenes here, but he's on rollerblades and he's yeah. just so dorky looking. Yeah. I'm like, that guy looks vaguely familiar. <laughs> it takes me, takes me quite a while. Uh, I'm like that to realize that's that's Brian Cranston. That's a guy that I remember so well from. I didn't know he could be funny. I had no idea. Yeah. I, I had no idea I'd seen him on. Seinfeld, I had no idea I'd seen him in Saving Private Ryan. The guy is such a chameleon. Yeah. And uh, he's not, you know, now people see him, they know who he is immediately. But at that time, and he's very proud of this, and rightly so, a working actor who is a character actor, yeah. which is a great thing to be able to say you are. Yeah. You know, if, you're, if you're lucky enough to be a movie star, you know, great for you. But if you're a really great character actor yeah. who can disappear into a role time and time again, I don't know that he can do that because it's so world famous. So yeah. Like, he's got the chops. I mean, just, he just, I, I saw him and I knew, I mean, I worked with him and I knew, later on I realized he could be funny and I was just like an extra cherry on top. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this guy, this is the guy for his role. Yeah. And by God, he was. Yeah. Hmm. Maybe one more here. Let's see. Uh, what other characters from Breaking Bad did you consider making a ser another series with? Did you explore him? Was it always Saul? Or? You know, we, we don't do anything with a great deal of 
planning. <laughs> yes, that's right. That's true. Yeah. Planning and forethought. We don't. There's surprisingly little. Uh, <laughs> people can be surprised how little. Yeah. We really. It was a joke on set. I'm told that one of our uh, uh, camera assistants uh, made the joke on the first episode that saw that the Bob Odenkirk was on. Oh, really? Season two of, of, uh, of Brady Bad said, you know, you guys, uh, when, you, when you do the spinoff series, better call Saul I want to be on. Or so some words to that effect. I, I was not there. I had heard that third hand. But it was this great joke, apparently, that originated on the, on the yeah. set of the very first episode he was in as a, mm. as a sporting character. We would joke about it after that in the writer's room. Well, when we're doing the Saul spinoffs, we're gonna, it was very much a joke. Yeah. Uh, and then, lo and behold, you realize, well, you know, the best jokes uh, contain not some small degree of truth. Yeah. And it was really not planned out that far in advance, we just thought, hey, why don't we do this? Yeah. But by the way, speaking of which, I mean, we were, we were, I mean, it's astounding the, the great actors. Yeah. Uh, we had a great band, uh, and the great characters that they embodied. Uh, there's so many, there's so many spin-off shows you could mm -hmm. do. Mm -hmm. uh, no question about it. I don't know that that will indeed happen, but not for lack of uh, ability or talent or, you know, just wonderful, you know. Yeah. Did, did, yeah, we could absolutely do it. Yeah. Maybe just as a follow-up, did you um, did you ever think that people would be saying what they're saying now about Better Call Saul that it's perhaps better than Breaking Bad? I mean, there's. No, I didn't. I, I really thought we were probably making a mistake when we when we set out to do it, but I wanted <laughs> I wanted to keep working. I, I, I uh, Breaking Bad. No, I mean, I mean seriously, I'm not even being funny. Uh, I don't mean it. In the sense of I wouldn't be able to get a job after Breaking Bad. I mean it in a very creatively existential sense of Breaking Bad was such an unexpected hit for me that I knew I would psych myself out when mm -hmm. it came time to do the next project. I, I would uh, I would say to myself because I know myself very well. I'm extraordinarily and, uh, and that's the truth. I mean, you got you know. By the way, you, for the writers of the room, be as honest with yourself as you can be, uh, because that I really think it helps with your writing, um, even though it's mostly nice. So. But <laughs> but it's like I knew when Breaking Bad ended, I was like I was not prepared for the hit that mm -hmm. was. And I'm not complaining. It was yeah. The hit that it, that, 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 that how it's changed my life. But I knew it would mess with my head. And I knew I would say to myself, okay, the next thing I do, it's got to be, uh, it's got to be even better than Breaking Bad. Mm -hmm. How are you going to do that? You know, Breaking Bad was lightning in a bottle. So how do you do that again? And so the opportunity quickly arose. The genesis of it being through a lot of joking. Right? <laughs> hey, we could do a better call yeah. spin off. So we did it, and it was, it was, we, it was, it was selfish reasons on my part. Uh, it was also we wanted to keep as much of the crew together, mm -hmm. keep shooting in Albuquerque. Mm -hmm. uh, but when when we really got going on it, we all, Peter and I looked at each other and said, this this could be after MASH. Mm -hmm. There a, was a show called MASH, one of the greatest TV shows, arguably the greatest TV show mm -hmm. you know, of all time. Sure yeah. Very small, short list of greatest TV shows of all time. Had a spinoff that no one remembers, maybe somebody mm -hmm. Very short-lived spinoff called After Mash, and it was and it was really not that bad, but it was a huge <laughs> flop, and it lasted half of a season or one season. Yeah. And it's not it's not that it was terrible, but it was just ill-fated. Yeah. Uh, and we thought, man, are we going to do that to ourselves? And the worst-case scenario, are we going to mess up people's? Are we going to leave a bad taste in people's mouths for? Breaking Bad, and then we thought, well, after Nashville, no one remembers it, so maybe we're just going to forget. Worst case scenario. And then, lo and behold, I get people all the time, like I said, coming up to me saying, I think I like Better Call Saul even, even better. Yeah. And I thought that would be, <coughs> sorry, yeah. that would be, uh, you know, like a white knife in the heart, especially yeah. because Peter Gould is running this show now, and I'm talking to you guys. So, it makes me so proud. Yeah. I just, I, the, the work they're doing is so wonderful. I, I just, uh, it makes me so happy. And, uh, you know, I love hearing people say they like it better. I love hearing people say, I still like Breaking Bad better. I love it all. It's yeah. very, very fortunate. Okay. 
Well, I think we're at time, so let's uh, give a round of applause.